the policemen who kill. For the first time, members of Kenya's death squad speak publicly about assassinating suspects. They were targeted, identified, and eliminated in front of their families. We don't arrest. We never. We are sharpshooters. Kenya's counter-terrorism strategy is edging the country into conflict, creating a generation of angry and alienated Muslims. Kenyans shot dead in cold blood. They are becoming a threat to global security, so do the elimination. Al Jazeera has been given confidential documents revealing the intelligence that drives this extrajudicial killing program. Intelligence that may have been supplied by Western security agencies. Once they give us the information, tomorrow is no longer there. The report that you gave us has been worked on. Al Jazeera investigates whether global powers are conducting a proxy war in Africa using a rule book from Israel. The part of the prevention sometimes is to kill the terrorists before trial. President Kenyatta has already faced charges of crimes against humanity at the International Criminal Court. He could soon find himself in the dock again, this time for ordering the killing of Muslim clerics. That execution was planned in Malambi by really top high lucky police officers and government officials. The work is very easy because we are always on a standby to get instruction. Go to A, B, C, D, hit A, B, C, D, and it's done. Period. And you get back. For years, Kenya has been rife with allegations of a secret government run counter terrorism program, one that targets suspected Muslim radicals. Al Jazeera's investigative unit has obtained exclusive access to the policemen who operate as government-sanctioned hitmen. Yeah, is all right? Fearing that speaking to us could put their lives at risk, we agreed to conceal their identity. We verified each officer's role within Kenya's security apparatus. They belong to different units, but work together to carry out assassinations. The first officer is a member of the Anti-Terrorism Police Unit, or the ATPU. The uh, role is just to, we can say, preventing, and when you need to be, elimination of the bad guys. We will call him the cop. Next, an officer from a commando unit called Recce Company, part of the police's general service unit, or GSU. It is a paramilitary group. It has a special training on its own. The aim is you kill fast before you are killed. He is the commando. The death squad also includes an officer from the National Security and Intelligence Service. We pass the right information to the right soul for the right action to be taken against them. Do you believe that some of the intelligence that you and your officers may have gathered on high-profile people has led to them being eliminated? Yes, of course. We've done it, and that is why we are there. The NSIS plays a central role in planning anti-terror operations. We call him the spy. Finally, there's a member of the radiation unit a rapid reaction team within the Kenyan police. I'm in radiation, and radiation, <laughs> I think, is very dangerous. He is called the gunman. And what kind of specialist activities do the radiation unit do? Issue of eliminations happening here and there, in Mombasa, Muslims, radicals, and all that. We are an elimination program. Let's get started because you may end up in jail before we get. 
At some point, they will send you to jail. <laughs> no, now, now it's not jail. Makaburi was the nickname of Abu Bakr Sharif Ahmed, a charismatic Muslim cleric from the Kenyan port city of Mombasa. So we need to, you guys need to sit out of eye line because Makaburi's going to look at you sitting there. So you need to move somewhere that he can't see you. I met him in November 2013. So I'm supposed to look at you? Yeah. Or look at him? No, no, oh. look at me. Makaburi told me that Muslims in Kenya face widespread government oppression. What do you think the outcome of that kind of oppression will be? The migration of young men going to jihad because they see it as a, a lack of law on their side. Uh, they cannot get justice, they get oppressed, they get killed, their sheikhs get killed. They cannot go to the government, it's the government which is doing it. Makaburi has appeared in court on numerous occasions, charged under Kenya's terrorism laws, but he was never convicted. How am I a terrorist? Who have I terrorized? That's why I'm in court now for three years and nothing has been proved against me. I'm the one who is being terrorized. My life is the one which is in, is, is in danger. Any sheikh who talks about the Islamic religion as a wall, meaning including jihad, is killed in Kenya. These confidential reports obtained exclusively by Al Jazeera claim to show that Makaburi had extensive links to the Somali militant group Al Shabaab and that he was planning and financing bombings in Kenya. But despite these alleged links, the authorities failed to produce enough evidence to convict him in court. Makaburi in Mombasa is a very dangerous person to our country. What do you do with such a person? Do you spare such a person because you are observing human rights? Makaburi was placed under surveillance. We move tactically to understand what is taking place on the ground. We collect this information, then we provide it to the right source for an action to be taken. When we receive the information that so and so is organizing a certain group who are likely to terrorize people, the first person to get rid of is the leader. Using the code name Chris for their target, they explained the intelligence needed before they could strike. You cannot just be told today, go and assassinate Chris. I don't know Chris. So number one, I have to be taken through. Who is this Chris? How often does he visit the supermarket? Does he come back after his duties and all that? What time does he arrive home? People known to the target can be used unwittingly as part of an operation. Sometimes we may use somebody to bring the person to a certain place where we can get this person with a minute and then we will. So you must understand who this Chris first before Chris is assassinated. I'm very sorry to say that. <laughs> Depending with the information that we have at that time, that's when we develop the idea whether we go to eliminate or to spare this person. On the evening of the 1st of April 2014, Makaburi was heading home from yet another court appearance, unaware that he was being watched. We have been told Makaburi is in Mombasa within such and such a mosque. We are in a camp, waiting for instruction, and always on a standby. So what did we do? At such and such a time, we get the Makaburi there. And then you, then you act? Yeah. Ours is to act. Makaburi was shot as he left the courtroom. He became the third prominent Muslim cleric murdered in Kenya in the last two years. Every other time these sheikhs are coming up and saying, we feel our life is threatened. And then the next day, puff, they're not there, and everything goes quiet. All were gunned down in front of witnesses, and all cases remain unsolved. When I met Makaburi six months before his death, 
He believed he already knew his fate and who would pull the trigger. The Reke squad, uh, which is a GSU squad in Nairobi, uh, those are the guys who are doing these killings all over Kenya. And uh, they have been given uh, immu immunity from persecution. So what they're doing is they're cleansing. Whoever is, a, whoever is a potential threat should be killed. Human rights groups have highlighted a further 18 suspected Islamic radicals gunned down by the police over the past two years. When someone is killed, at least show that you are concerned that you're carrying out investigations. Show us that you are able to track some of the killers, but you can't have people being shot dead every week, and then the government does nothing. The fact that these individuals so high profile have been assassinated in broad daylight sometimes, um, and then followed up with basically no investigation, raises serious questions about what the goal is uh, by the Kenyan authorities. Who killed Makabui? Makabui was killed by the police. That execution was planned in Nairobi by very top high active police officers and government officials. The government did it. Yeah. This is the person who is bringing trouble here. Let us eliminate and we have peace. The Kenyan authorities clamp down on suspected Islamic militants as a reaction to events in nearby Somalia. In 2006, Ethiopia, assisted by the United States, invaded, overthrowing Somalia's Islamic government. Five years later, Kenya became directly embroiled in the conflict, sending in several thousand soldiers. Kenya invaded Somalia in order to crush the increasingly powerful Islamist movement, Al-Shabaab. They went into that war thinking they would sweep Shabaab into the sea. Instead, what they've done is opened the door for Al-Shabaab to enter Kenya. They now have a domestic insurgency. And recent events show that Shabab has learned very quickly how to exploit the many local political conflicts that Kenya contains. That makes Shabab the most dangerous thing the Kenyan state has ever faced. Since the invasion of Somalia, there have been multiple attacks by Al-Shabab inside Kenya. There's no denying how serious the threat is here in Kenya. We've just been told that one of the main police stations in Nairobi has been hit by an IED. Move, move! We arrive to chaotic scenes. A grenade detonated by the bomb squad sent people running for cover. The car bomb had killed four people including two police officers. <laughs> Muslims have been in East Africa for centuries and now make up at least 10% of Kenya's population. This is the Masjid Musa Mosque in Mombasa. The government claims the sermons here are encouraging violence against the Kenyan state. Some worshippers feel the government's actions are drawing them into this increasingly violent insurgency. In February 2014, the mosque was raided by the police. By the time the operation was over, eight people had died, 
Over 120 worshippers were arrested. Some have never been seen again. Even now, as we are speaking right now, their families don't know where they are. They are not in police cell, they are not in police custody, they are not in jails. But the last place they were seen was in a police vehicle. Where are they? Are they dead? Possibly. They might be dead. Killed by the police? That is police work. Sababu paka hivi sasa serikali hii ya Kenya, serikali ya kikafiri, inataka kujua kila yule ambao vijana ambao wanaotaka kuzungumza kuhusu mambo ya jihadi kuwamaliza. Hawataki tena kujua mambo ya koti sasa. Sasa ni kuamua sasa ikiwa kuna vijana wote ambao wanaotaka kuendeleza hii ibada ya jihadi ni kuwamaliza. The Masjid Musa Mosque has long been at the heart of the conflict enveloping Kenya. It was here that Sheikh Aboud Rogo, one of the most controversial imams in East Africa, delivered his sermons. He taught that Muslims have a duty to help restore Islamic rule in Somalia. In 2012, Abu Rogo was placed on the United Nations sanctions list for providing support to Al Shabab. The accusation surprised Rogo's family, who run a chicken farm outside Mombasa. Yeye mwenyewe pesa yeye mwenye shida. Maisha yake mwenyewe ni hivyo patapotea. Hana kwamba ni hata ni shangaa nilivyosikia amekiwa sanction na sema ana biashara gani, ana mali gani, hana bank account. Siko sababu bulikuwa hawaridhiki na zile lecture zake akizitoa masjid. Police charged Abu Rogo with possession of guns and ammunition and membership of Al Shabab. But despite being scrutinized by the world security forces, there was insufficient evidence to convict him. You take him to court, then you find that the next day he has been bailed out. You arrest him another time, take him to court, acquito. So it's just that elimination method. If the law cannot work, there's another option. Which is? Eliminate you. Lakini ilikuwa najua iko si kubwa bangu atauwa. Kitu kingine ilikuwa uko tayari washaanza kumwandama. One morning in August 2012, seven months after walking free from court, Abu Drogo was driving his wife to hospital. Sasa nikawa pia I was wondering kwa nini leo barabara iko kimya hivi. Hata sijazungumza kitu. The vehicle that uh, the sheikh was in was isolated from the rest. All the shots that were fired were on target. It's only one that went off target and this hit the wife on the leg, but the rest were on target. This is something that is done very professionally. Na vile alivyokwenda very slow paka chini, ndio mimi nikapiga kilele nilikuwa na watoto nikamwambia kwisha babaenu ameshauliwa. We don't arrest. We never. In rec company we are sharp shooters. And why should be a sharpshooter be taken to arrest? <laughs> so there's, the orders are very clear then? Yeah. To eliminate? Red Kamban is a sharpshooter, and the sharpshooter is always on target. According to the officers we spoke to, the order to assassinate Muslim clerics comes from a powerful body at the heart of the Kenyan government, the National Security Council. The comprises of president, deputy president, chief of the defence forces, inspector general of police, NSIS director, 
cabinet secretary of interior and the principal secretary interior. Any decision is made within that club of people. President Uhuru Kenyatta and other members of the National Security Council have categorically denied the existence of an extrajudicial killing program. President Kenyatta has also faced questions at the International Criminal Court, accused of involvement in the deaths of hundreds of political rivals. The case was dropped because the Kenyan government refused to hand over vital evidence. He and other senior Kenyan ministers refused to answer our questions. Instead, we put the allegations directly to the Kenyan police. To my knowledge, I don't think that uh, there's any program in the National Police Service uh, which deals with elimination. What is your response when people say that the government are behind those killings? These are issues which are, are under investigations. Can you at least deny that it was the Kenyan government that's involved in? No, I can't uh, comment on that because at my level, there are things which I, I cannot uh, come out and speak because I don't speak to on behalf of everybody. I speak on behalf of the National Police Service. But these accusations are against the police. Why can't you comment or at least deny that? Uh, suffice it to, uh, to be uh, left at that so that we don't go uh, there. Why? Uh, that, uh, I think, uh, is uh, more on me than on the institution I speak for. Were you on any of the operations to kill any of those high-profile imams in Mombasa? Yeah, yeah. But I can't disclose now. <laughs> when the authorities say to me that they played no part in the killing of high-profile imams, are they lying? They're lying. I can't tell you that they are lying. We've spoken to officers, though, who say that their units were involved in the elimination of those imams. Well, I won't uh, comment. Uh, respectfully, let me not comment on that. So the position of the Kenyan government to serious accusations of illegality, extrajudicial killings, is no comment? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that. What is, what is the response <laughs> of the Kenyan government then? Ah, well, well, well. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, allow me uh, not to go into that. With the greatest respect, I can't allow you not to go into that because that is your job. I spoke to a serving GSU officer from the radiation unit. Makuburi was eliminated. We were ordered by the government. I can't... Uh, I have another I ATP officer. Uh, Makuburi killed by the police. It was planned in Nairobi by high-ranking officials. Can you at least deny that that's true? No, I cannot deny or I cannot uh, agree to that. Coming up, the complicity of the Western governments that train and support the death squads. Their failure to act is allowing state violence to spread through Kenyan life. How many eliminations do you think your unit has carried out over the last few years? It's many, it's many. I think with my colleagues, uh, da, 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 around eight, but uh, it's not even a subject to, <laughs> to address. Since I was employed, I've killed over 50. And does that make you proud? Definitely, I do become proud because I've eliminated some problems. Day in, day out, you hear of eliminating suspects. We have the police itself. We have special units like GSU. So in love to total, we can see about almost 500. A year? Yeah. yeah. Extrajudicial killings have been happening at an alarming rate. People have now considered them as just any other act. They've become so normal, also to speak, you know, such that uh, the government does not feel in any way that this is something we need to, to address. We know for a fact because we see those killings happening within our communities almost on a daily basis.
This sense of impunity means that extrajudicial killings are not limited to suspected Islamic militants. The mountain town of Nyeri is an hour's drive from the capital, Nairobi. In April 2014, five young people were watching football in a local bar. As they left, witnesses reported an altercation with police. The group were arrested and driven away. Saa 12 hapo jirani yangu nikasikia lady katagasa. Kuna msichana alipati wakiuna watu walipatikana msichana akiwa hata na matope kama amehang. Ame ame nini? Amewekwa juu ya miti. Mimi mara moja nikasikia mwili wangu imekatika. At her daughter's feet were the bodies of four young boys shot in the head. wangu alikuwa na alama hapa ilikuwa aud hapa na ingine na ingine hapa zilikuwa bili hapa na hapa alikuwa na na hapa na hapa alafu sijui kama mdomo alikuwa kwa sababu alikuwa anatoa nini ile dabu da mbapua na mdomo the two boys were lying there. Two other boys were lying here. The families are convinced that the police executed their children and are left with one haunting question. Nikaulisa ni kwa nini tu naweza kutaka tu kujua. Ninaweza kutaka tu nijue haki. Dugu yake alikuwa analia sema dugu yangu hata hajakaa mwaka they were taken from a club. My research has indicated that they actually were taken to a police station and then not booked in, taken to a forest and shot dead. The police had a great liking of the forests. Uh, they would often take people out there in order to shoot them. Philip Alston is the author of a United Nations report on extrajudicial killings in Kenya. It followed hundreds of deaths after the elections in 2007. His investigation delivered a damning indictment of the Kenyan police. They were not uh, what one might call discriminating. A lot of the killings were simply casual, accidental, as it were. Someone that you arrest, someone who won't pay a bribe, someone who gets in the way of a cop who's running a bar or something like that. Just dispose of the people. He found that the police would frequently respond with unlawful force. The conclusion I reached was that killing was widespread, uh, that it was basically part of the way in which the police force operated, uh, that it wasn't just tolerated by the senior police but directed by them. The UN investigation did little to change the culture of the police in Kenya, and that same force now has a role in Kenya's war with al-Shabaab. The current war that Kenya is involved in gives all of the security agencies the blanket cover that they are doing this because of that war. Now that blanket cover excuses any explanation at all. And it is a very dangerous thing for ordinary citizens. Very dangerous indeed. A fortnight after the killings of the five young people in Nyeri, Security sources claimed in the media that the victims had links to the Somali militant group Al-Shabaab. I don't think I know mambo ya Al-Shabaab. Aliwahi enda Somali? Hapana, hajawahi enda. Amekaa huku miaka yote. That is a scapegoat. To those who did the action, 
they are trying to escape by saying that they went to Somalia and that and such things. Sasa wako na wakinge au watoto kile kimewaua ni walshabab. Lakini hakuna kitu kama hiyo. It appears any victim of police abuse can be labeled a terrorist, even the one shot by accident. You may shoot and shoot the wrong person. Do you wait to be taken to court to be jailed? Okay, you never wanted to kill that person, but accidentally you have done it. What are you going to do? The person is gone. You will not bring him back. Do you plant evidence sometimes? Yeah. Some do place some kind of evidence by placing some pistols, guns, besides them once they have been killed. Police killings are rarely independently investigated in Kenya. We left Nairobi to meet a woman who's in hiding after calling for an inquiry into the killing of her husband by the police. Rahima Nero's husband was arrested as a suspected Al-Shabaab insurgent. Salim Nero was taken back to their home, handcuffed and surrounded by police. akaingia na polisi ndani wakaanza kunipiga wakanipiga paka nkafuro upande huu walipomaliza hapo wakanichukua na mtoto wangu wakaniambia nkae sitting nkakaa hapo akaanza kuniuliza uliza maswali sikujua wafanya nini ndani Walipomaliza hapo nkasika milwa risasi ndani. Walipomua wakaniambia tu ndo kaone mume wako tumua. The police later claimed Salim Nero had been armed and that he and another suspect had been killed during a shootout. Walidai kuwa amemkuta na bunduki ndani ya nyumba na haikuwa hivyo. I can remember they were even shot in front of their family. They were targeted, identified, and eliminated. When they say they were killed in self-defense, it's not true. It's not true. I would say that's standard operating procedure the so-called shootout uh, scenario where you set it up to make it look as though someone who you have executed uh, was involved in a shootout with the police. And in order to do that, it's better to have a weapon that you've confiscated from somewhere else to leave beside the body. The police will tell them that was a suspected terrorist. We found one gun and two rounds of ammunition, and that's it you're already labeled as a suspected terrorist. And unfortunately, this is what uh, the fight against terrorism is using now to further violate rights with impunity. In 1998, 224 people were killed after a bomb destroyed the US embassy in Kenya. A simultaneous attack on the US facility in Tanzania killed a further 10. For the first time, the world heard the names Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Since then, there has been a close relationship between Kenya and the West's global war on terror. Western countries have provided Kenya with hundreds of millions of dollars in counter-terrorism training and equipment. Since 2009, the US alone has provided over $125 million. Britain, the former colonial power, continues to aid the police using a portion of its £30 million overseas counter-terrorism budget. We've seen them quite recently providing equipment. They have provided, provided vehicles, we've seen them provided firearms, tactical firearms, and we've seen them even providing boats for the border patrol unit. The death squads we spoke to had all received specialist military training from British officers. Normally it takes 
in three months. Once they have trained us, they take us to the field where we do practical work. It's the kind of movement you do make when you are at war. The link between the British intelligence service and their Kenyan counterparts is at the core of this relationship. The British are training the, the, the intelligence persons. We are getting very good uh, uh, training on how to conduct what we call the surveillance. So we are getting very, very advanced ways of getting information. If we get any person in Kenya that is a threat to the security of the UK, then we need to pass over this information to the MI5 so that MI5 can come in and actually utilize that intelligence. Israel also has strong intelligence links to Kenya. We have been leaked confidential police documents appearing to show Israeli intelligence that highlights threats to their interests in Kenya. Information like this is allowing Israel to exert growing influence over Kenya's counter-terrorism strategy. There are some departments that are getting some training from the Israelis. This secret document obtained by Al Jazeera reveals that Kenya and Israel have developed a close understanding on intelligence matters. Israel's foreign intelligence service Mossad is allowed to run safe houses and its own operations in the country. And in return, Israeli agents have exposed the activities of foreign intelligence networks to the Kenyans. Initially, we had Britain. Uh, the Israelites came in, but there were some kind of arguments. They wanted to have GSU as a unit under the Israelites, but the British denied. However, the government is doing that secretly. In terms of training, the GSU long ago moved away from predominantly British training towards Israeli training. Police have a sense, I think, that the Israelis understand their problems better than the Brits and other Europeans do, in the sense that the Israelis are themselves fighting an internal counterinsurgency, uh, they understand what might be needed in such a war and their attitude towards what you have to do is far more permissive and perhaps less rules bound than are some others. We have a lot in common because I think that both for Israel and for uh, Kenya, one of the main threats is from the radical Islam and mainly from the radical Islamic terror organizations. Uh, that are active in this region. This classified Mossad briefing was written after an assault by Al-Shabaab militants on the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi, which left 67 dead. It reveals concerns that Israel's assistance to Kenya's counter-terrorism units during the attack was leaked to the media, and it claims that Al-Shabaab is planning further, more extreme violence in Kenya, including attacks on Western and Israeli targets. You get some instructors from uh, Israel. Is how to eliminate. Yeah, actually, he's, a, he's one of the training. <laughs> they teach you how to eliminate people? Yeah. I think that the Kenyans, uh, they have the authority and the right to run their own affairs. So if they decide to run a targeted killing uh, operation, we will, I don't think that we will, uh, uh, we will uh, condemn them. A part of the prevention sometimes is to kill the terrorists before trial. This is a necessary option, not, not only legitimate. We do not hide uh, behind uh, any walls and curtains. We use it in our fight against uh, terror. It is a very effective uh, tool. The Israeli Foreign Office, however, told us, 
under no circumstances are eliminations part of any kind of training imparted by Israeli experts. The British Foreign Office said it is aware of the allegations of extrajudicial killings in Kenya, adding, we take such allegations extremely seriously and raise concerns with the Kenyan authorities. Do you think the British who train and fund the ATPU and the GSU know that you guys are eliminating terrorist targets? They do. How? Once they give us the information, they know what they have told us, it is APCD. Mr. Jack is involved in such and such a kind of activity. Tomorrow is no longer there. We have worked. Definitely the report that you gave us has been worked on. Are the British made aware of the elimination programs as well? Yes, when, uh, when these people come for their training, I believe that all this information is being passed to them. Donors who are involved in supporting and providing equipment are also apparently not overseeing uh, these operations properly because again and again and again we are raising instances of serious abuses, abuses that would not be acceptable anywhere else. And when people like Makaburi is killed or an Abu Drogo, do the British ever come to your senior commanders and say, No, they don't. Stop, stop, stop. Once they give you the training, that is all. They go back to their country and they leave us to do our work. There are many in the intelligence and security community, including among British senior staff, who would argue that the front line is where the rough stuff happens, and maybe we just have to grin and bear it. The balance of security and foreign policy interests are such that Kenya is still viewed as a necessary ally in this region. And until that changes, we're going to have to swallow this stuff for the foreseeable future. But could Western governments be held legally responsible for the actions of the men they trained? The first person to get rid of is the leader. We showed our interviews to the head of the International Bar Association. Sometimes you know, whether we go to eliminate or to spare this person. It's clear, based on these interviews, that there's at least prima facie evidence to suggest that uh, these third-party countries are involved, and therefore uh, they all have a responsibility to investigate. They are training the, the, the intelligence persons. Members of the British government could even face charges at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. I think absolutely could be a criminal investigation because if there are individuals that are found to be not just training but are actually found to have been directing, supervising, targeting individuals that in turn would be targeted uh, in a killing, uh, then there, uh, there is a, a criminal responsibility. We do share all this information. I don't want to be very specific, but the government did it. If they're arguing that perhaps they didn't know, they didn't have reason to know that these uh, crimes were being committed, they now know. After seeing our evidence, he believes that Western countries should reconsider their support of Kenya's police force. We should stop providing any type of assistance or training uh, to police units in Kenya until there's a clear change, a paradigm shift, if you will, in how the Kenyan authorities deal uh, with suspects uh, and with individuals that they consider to be dangerous to the state, and that does not include target killings. In 2014, in response to the growing violence, two major tourist companies suspended holidays to Kenya. Despite the continuing loss of life and economic impact, there appears to be no change in strategy, either by the Kenyan government or the Western countries that support them. I think we are not going to see an end of this. What will happen is that we are going to see more radicalization of the youth 
because somebody somewhere will tell them, you see, Rogo died a martyr, Makaburi died a martyr fighting for the religion, so we are not going to see an end of this. The killings of clerics like Makaburi and Abu Rogo have failed to quell the insurgency. Waislam hapa Kenya sisi tunadhalilishwa tunauliwa mashekhe zetu wanauliwa ndugu zetu mashababu ambao ni vijana wanauliwa sisi tukipata silaha tutapambana na wao kama vile wao wanavyotufanyia Do you actually believe that by eliminating these people you are making this country safer and the answer obviously is no Terrorists want exactly that that Kenyans are shot dead in cold blood. Another generation could already be in the sights of the Kenyan authorities. The killing of Sheikh Abu Rogo was one of the first carried out by the Kenyan death squads. His son could be the next. Actually, like that boy now, I'm sure He's on the spot. He may be in danger. Mimi wasema ni recruiter wa vijana ndani ya Mombasa. Asa ogiogope za kwa huo ni ujinga wao wenyewe. Maana mwanzo gaidi hana time ya kukaa kunini kufanya biashara ya kuku. If you were told to go and shoot a young boy like that, I mean he's a young kid. What would you do? Normally what happened to young boy like that one? He's being killed in a way that he just disappears. He can be killed and thrown in the next forest. He'll be eaten and forgotten. <laughs>